Yeah, Chris is not coming. Oh, bring, sweet. So. We'll get out here early. Yeah, we will. That's what we said. Yeah, <laughs> Home in time for lunch. <laughs> All right, we are live. All right, thank you for sticking around for the last session. Um, you know, after, after hearing the last session, you think growing hemp is simple. <laughs> uh, I know one thing, I don't want to be a farmer. Um, I want to work with farmers. And so with that, we are moving right into the last session, and we're going to talk about the business of hemp. So we've got three presentations. Um, this session is going to be moderated by Charles Felix, who is a publisher, owner of Cannabis News Florida and South Florida Hospital News and Healthcare Report. I don't know if you've seen his publication, but if you want to get caught up on what's going on in the industry related to cannabis, his publication is something you need to uh, pick up and subscribe to and take advantage of because it's a wealth of information. So, Charles, I'm turning it over to you, sir. Well, we, uh, I welcome everybody. I'm actually very, very impressed that there are that many people in the room, still in the room, and haven't escaped yet. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's very, very good. Well, we, we've gone through a lot, in, if you've been to uh, most of the sessions, if not all the sessions, you know, and we've gone through the farming part of it, what you need to do, dealing with bugs. I was listening to the last one. I didn't realize there were so many bugs in the world. Oh. I'm afraid to go home now and have a plant in my house. I think it's going to eat me at night, okay? <laughs> uh, so... But with that being said, I'm a, we're going to talk a little bit about the other side of the, of the business, of the bug business, per se, and that's bugging out and being able to sell stuff. Yeah. Because, because at the end of the day, from a farming standpoint, uh, you go to farm, you got to kill all the bugs, but at the end of the day, you're going to have a crop, and you got to find somebody to buy it to be able to be useful. So we have two gentlemen here today. Unfortunately, this, the CPA, uh, Chris, could not make it. Uh, and as I told people, I actually still hold the CPA license, but do not ask me an accounting question because I don't practice. So I'm just telling you that. Do not ask me anything. So, but with that, we have two people who actually use the product, use the hemp products, and to be able to tell you how you can benefit by contracting with your crop ahead of time to make sure that you don't lose money. Uh, so with that, I'm going to bring up... Uh, Jeff Green, uh, I've known Jeff for too many years. Yes. Uh, uh, before he even started his business, starting his business, and, and one of the things he was able to do, uh, and it's very important in business, is find that niche. Uh, not do what everybody else does. And, and Jeff was able to do that and master it, to be able to work to his benefit, and he, he, he came up with something that nobody else did, and very successful in what he did. So, uh, Jeff Green, Jeff, tell us a little bit about your business. Thanks. Welcome him. Does that move automatically, or do I have to move? I think you, I think they, you tell them to move. Unless there's a, there's a clicker right here. Is that click? All right. Uh, good uh, afternoon. No. No. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> 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 um, First of all, thanks for coming. This industry is uh, struggling. I think uh, COVID certainly hurt us as an industry. Um, I know that uh, we're being pushed out a little bit by the profitability of the marijuana industry. And um, one of the things that I'm gonna be pushing for at the next legislative session is uh, subsidy funding for uh, this program that Gene's put on as well as uh, some of the nonprofits in the state because uh, without this, we're not going to survive, and we need this, and we need to make sure that we keep it up. So with that being said, I'll go into my program, but I just wanted to start with that. We've got to keep this industry going, and uh, people like us, with like Jody, like all the people that have pushed this from the very beginning, uh, we've got to make sure that we all eat and stay alive. <laughs> um, so just to go over... Uh, the company that I started was Greens Reserve. Uh, my background is uh, that when the Farm Bill was passed in 2017-18, uh, the federal leg legislation made this industry possible. Um, the state of Florida adopted a research uh, bill the following year, which I lobbied for. It passed a commercialization bill the following year, which I lobbied for. It passed a glitch bill that fixed the two things that we screwed up the first two years, the third year, and we got that passed. So we were three for three. I worked myself out of a job, 
and had to go out and start a trade association, which is the Florida Hemp Council. And then COVID hit, and I had to figure out what else I wanted to be when I grew up, and we started Greens Reserve, uh, which is what we're going to talk about today. Greens Reserve is a uh, smokeless tobacco alternative using the hemp flour. We grind it, we flavor it, we put it in a can, we make it look like uh, all the other tobacco products, but there's no nicotine and there's no tobacco. And the very first thing I wanted to do was get my product on Amazon, which is one thing that most hemp companies have not been able to do. Um, through my contacts um, and my advocacy, I met the vice president of regulated products on Amazon and through that assistance was able to put our product on Amazon. We are still working on the advertising side of Amazon, but I'll, start, I'll speak about that in just a minute. So federal leg legislation, uh, the Farm Bill, there's a new Farm Bill that's coming out. Uh, we're very cautious on what the new Farm Bill is going to do to our industry, uh, but watching it closely. State regulations, uh, Commissioner Freed will no longer be Commissioner Freed at the end of the year. Um, so we're looking at that uh, race and uh, whether Wilton Simpson or a Democrat will come in and change our, our, our plan. Hopefully we'll improve it. Um, Amazon products, uh, basically, I always say there's three rules. There's federal law, there's state law, and there's Amazon law. Um, when I talk to the three state regulators in South Dakota, uh, Idaho, and Louisiana, and said, can we sell our product in your state? They said, no, but you're selling on Amazon, right? And I said, yeah. And she said, just sell it on Amazon in our state. <laughs> 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 so that's the, uh, that's the straight from the regulators of the three most prohibitive states in the United States. Um, USDA, there's a field of acronyms that if you don't know by now, you should. Um, the USDA regulates farming. Uh, the FDA is supposed to regulate drugs and food, and I use the supposed word uh, there uh, specifically. Uh, Federal Trade Commission regulates advertising, and you're starting to see some uh, warning letters to come out with uh, people um, there. Uh, the SBA is supposed to help small business. Again, the supposed word there means that they don't, but they should. Uh, the USTR manages trade relations with other countries, uh, which is part of the White House. They uh, manage exportation. And the OMB manages the National um, Industry Classification System codes, which classify every product made or grown. Um, and again, they are supposed to uh, make legal products easily available through the NAICS codes. Uh, we lobbied for hemp products to be added at the last adjustment, which happened last year. We got one out of 247 recommendations and we'll be recommending 246 or more in five years when the next time comes around. <laughs> so that is your federal government working for you. In Florida, you'll need a permit to do anything that involves hemp. Some of them are free, some of them are not. <laughs> uh, if you don't get them, uh, the state can come in and make your life miserable. <laughs> Everybody got that? Uh, states to watch out for, again, Louisiana, Mississippi, Arkansas, Kentucky, Nebraska, South Dakota, and Idaho are all states where you have to be uh, very careful unless you're selling on Amazon. <laughs> and then you can do whatever you want. <laughs> and so that's where we're going to start here. Uh, the Greens Reserve story was getting our product on Amazon. Road to Amazon, make a product, make a label, get your label checked, modify your label, get ready to pivot because once you get started, you're going to have to change your plan. <laughs> and then be persistent. Um, we started out with our label as full spectrum hemp snuff. Our current product is hemp snuff. Full spectrum scared everybody. <laughs> <laughs> So we removed the word full spectrum and our product was automatically compliant. <laughs> um, we had a picture on Amazon on the side label that said our product contains less than 0.3% THC, which is required by state law. When the Amazon 
inspectors saw THC on the side of our label, they freaked out and shut us down for three months. <laughs> uh, we had to remove that picture, replace it with just a picture of our top, and we've been compliant ever since. <laughs> <laughs> so not always does your product have to be compliant, it just has to look compliant and still be compliant. <laughs> um, in many cases, what you're finding on Amazon is uh, it, areas where one side doesn't know what the other side is doing, uh, which is true with any large company or government in general. And essentially what was happening is their policy of a product cannot contain THC or CBD has been modified to we can't advertise that. <laughs> And so that's really what's kind of going down. And that public opinion and rules and regulations is being modified throughout industry and everywhere else for that matter. That, and that's coming. One of the things that you have to do as a hemp product right now is survive. Uh, you've got to get through the process of uh, getting your product, getting consumers to like it. Um, the company that I lobbied for back in 2017 and 18 was Green Roads. They were able to get enough co consumers to like their product to be able to change the rules. Uh, if you're not big enough to do that, then you've got to let those big companies change the rules and then work off of what they've done. And that's kind of where we're at today. Advertising on Amazon is not the same as product approval. Um, we have a nice urinal cake on Amazon right now that says piss on cancer. Uh, they don't like the word piss, so we can't advertise it. <laughs> so there's varying things that you've got to learn as you go through this process. We have launched a hockey puck with our top label on it uh, because we can't advertise something with hemp in it, but we can advertise a hockey puck with our label on it. <laughs> so. We are doing that now. Um, for uh, any of you hockey fans out there, we're going through the Stanley Cup and we're gonna be advertising the shit out of hockey, so. <laughs> um, uh, we're still arguing with them. Uh, their rules are antiquated and uh, constantly changing. We, we try to push the envelope uh, and that's what I've done as a lobbyist and a, and a product owner, uh, and a company owner is push the envelope, continue to change the things you can um, and just keep being persistent. And then ultimately you got to watch your snowball grow. Uh, once your product is a, uh, approved, um, Google let us advertise for 32 days, shut us down for 64 days, let us advertise for 31 days, shut us down for 92 days. In other words, do what you can. Um, the social media advertising is the safest right now. Um, there's Convenience stores that are allowing hemp products, you'll see uh, Circle K, Sunoco, uh, several of the other uh, convenience stores starting to bring it in, a lot of the independents. Um, we've got a couple of distributors that are distributing our product nationwide, and we just picked up a big uh, tobacco uh, company uh, private label for us. So um, start with friends and family, uh, grow with an organized plan, and then Ultimately, you've got to find money to scale. Uh, it cost us about $2 million to get where we're at, and then it cost me another $1 million to buy out the first $1 million, so $3 million raised for a $2 million company because I had to buy the first four guys out that didn't want to stay because it took two years instead of six months uh, because of varying things. Uh, Building a, building a building in the state of Florida in the last year has taken longer, um, it costs more. Um, every th building supplies right now cost about 30 to 35% more, so if you're putting up uh, walls and floor that are uh, CGMP compliant where you can wash them, those products are up 55% from when I bought them two years ago. Um, so our $2 million investment today, if you had to start now, would probably be closer to three, three and a half million. So it, it costs money to scale, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And, but you've got to start with proof of concept. It's the reality of what Charles talked about is it doesn't matter whether people grow hemp. If you don't have a place to sell it, the farmers are not going to grow it for long. And that's where we're at in the market. We're contract manufacturing. Uh, manufacturers are contracting farmers to grow. 
instead of farmers contracting with manufacturers to sell. And that's going to be consistent probably for the next three or four, probably 10 years. Um, I, was re I, was, I watch uh, the Food That Built America on the History Channel, and one of the things that Chef Boyardee did when they started their company was went to the potato farmers and convinced them to, make, to grow tomatoes. And they did that by guaranteeing the purchase of those tomatoes. It's going to be no different here. When companies go out and scale, they'll go to the farmers, they'll commit to a price, and if the farmer's happy with that price, they'll grow uh, that crop instead of another crop. And that's the way that I see this going. Um, the speculative growing that's happened for the last three or four years has been crazy. Um, two large companies in Kentucky and Colorado promised the farmers the moon. Both of them declared bankruptcy and the farmers have been uh, disengaged ever since. Uh, they're trying to come back, but I think that the damage has been done. It's hard to unring that bell. Mm -hmm. And I think that as we go forward, uh, products are going to drive this industry, not farmers. Right now, we've got to get, there, there's supposedly 25,000 products you can make out of hemp. I busted my brain to come up with 200. If you can come up with 201, I would like to see it. Um, but snuff, you know, tobacco replacement is one, cotton replacement, and the cotton industry doesn't want to say that, cotton supplement is going to be what, uh, We'll you know, talk about cotton, wool, and hemp working collaboratively instead of uh, hemp replacing them. Um, the, the plant was made illegal because of the fears of the paper and tobacco industry. So um, that's pretty much my presentation. I'm much more of a conversationalist than a presentation giver. So uh, that's my cell phone number, my email address, uh, my resume, uh, what I can do. And uh, we'll push this industry forward one step at a time and take it from there. Any questions by anybody? You got a question? There we go. Yeah, in regards to the Costa Rica. Wait, wait, wait. wait. <laughs> now. Good morning. With regards to the uh, Costa Rican uh, Hemp Council, uh, what's the driver? Uh, is it just ex market expansion? What are you uh, looking to accomplish through um, Costa Rica? Yeah. So uh, the founder of the, Flo of the Costa Rican Hemp Council came to me and said that they were going to legalize marijuana and, and hemp in Costa Rica. And yeah, of course, I want to get my product in Costa Rica. So I uh, paid the $5,000 and joined their board. <laughs> No, I, I've tried very hard to continue to buy hemp in the state of Florida, and, and I will continue to do so. Um, right now, uh, speculative prices for hemp ranges from 50 cents to $2 a pound, and contracted hemp is at some points in Florida $24 a pound. So I, uh, I need to be at closer to eight, and so uh, if, if I can find a Florida farmer that is willing to grow what we need for roughly eight dollars a pound, um, then we look at it. Um, you know, we're fresh from Florida, so we like to stay with Florida product. Um, one of my investors is my current supplier, and um, you know that's kind of where we're at. Um, but with scale comes the need for more. Yeah, hi. Do you think that uh, a lot of the rules and regulations and prohibitions will change if the federal government legalizes marijuana? I think that if the federal government legalizes marijuana, you're going to see some structural changes, banking, credit card processing, things like that. But uh, do I think, you know, right now at least, the money in marijuana versus the money in hemp, the labs are starting to go marijuana because they're making so much more money in marijuana than they are in hemp. Gene is not making money on this event, but he is making money in the medical marijuana events he, he hosts. So that's the kind of thing that we've got to work on. It do, it's not necessarily going to make it easier or harder. Um, there are people that want to get high, and there are people that want to get well. <laughs> and that's what we've got to differentiate. Um, you know, our snuff doesn't make you high. 
but it does get your nicotine addiction off. So that's what we're pushing. Uh, so I think that um, if we work with marijuana, which we should because it's the same damn plant, <laughs> that then we are more collaborative. Um, quite frankly, I work with tobacco. I mean, the, my largest contract that's coming in right now is a private label contract with a tobacco company, and it's $10 million. So why would I not? <laughs> And that's the other thing is you can grow your, your company to be a nice pay, your, pay yourself to work product, make $50,000, $100,000 a year and, and pay your mortgage and eat, or you can build it to be a multi-million dollar company, and that's what scale is. That's the difference. I got a question for you. This on? Yeah. Gene, um, I, I mean... Uh, what would you think of the next product in the state of Florida? Obviously, you've, you've captured one. Mm -hmm. uh, in order for the farmers to get excited about growing more or using more acreage to grow hemp, what other products do you think could come to the state of Florida that would make sense? Because mm -hmm. obviously, as we said earlier, there's no use in growing it if I haven't got a buyer at the other end. Yeah. Um, shoot. I mean, there's a ton. Um, there's uh, graphene companies that are talking about replacing fiberglass and, and steel mm -hmm. with hemp. Um, there's a new uh, auto manufacturer that's being built in southern Georgia that Florida, manufacturer, Florida manufacturers could assist. Mm -hmm. uh, feminine hygiene products, I think, would be a phenomenal opportunity for hemp. Um, we're making uh, our expired hemp. Uh, snuff has become a soil amendment that we're selling to landscapers and we've gotten tremendous results from our uh, flowering plants are about 300 percent of uh, flowering and lemons have grown about 300 percent larger when we add our uh, soil amendment to the to the soil so it's an amazing freaking plant I mean it, it really is but the and the reality of it is, is it can replace almost anything. There's a woman in California making paper products. There's mm -hmm. a, certainly a Florida company can make paper Eric products. Right. Tiny e-paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's, you know, there's one or two folks right now um, that are struggling and trying to survive. Uh, one of the things that we've seen in the industry is consolidation. It, it takes money to make money, and Green Road sold out to Valens. Mm -hmm. Just CBD sold out to Flora Grown. They're, the big companies are growing up into those publicly traded companies because capital is impossible to get. Mm -hmm. We're a capital-starved industry right now. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I think could be done, and I've got a call on Thursday with, is creating a, a federal uh, hemp credit union that could take in uh, companies' money and bank them, but also process credit cards for them and lend to them. And so that's the next thing that I'm going to really start jumping into. I, my background is uh, 20 years in the mortgage industry, five years in the financial services industry, 10 years in the natural gas industry, uh, ten, you know, seven years now in Jesus Christ, seven years now in the cannabis industry. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, so I try to use all of my uh, talent to do something, uh, and then I don't like to do anything small. But could, okay, you know, what you were saying about where you buy product from, and it's cheaper to buy it in Kentucky now than it, than it is really anywhere yeah. else. <clears throat> Question being is, do you believe, and not to be negative, but do you believe that in the state of Florida and the growing conditions in the state of Florida, that you can get a reasonably priced crop to be able to sell and for people not to go elsewhere to be able to manufacture their products? Well, first and foremost, I think Florida farmers are the most resilient, brilliant people on the planet. Mm -hmm. So I think, yes. Uh, will it happen tomorrow? I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that this is, you know, the crazy part about this plant is it can grow anywhere. Um, unfortunately, it can't grow anywhere well. Um, if you listen to Dr. Osborne, uh, this plant is loved by everybody and every buck. <laughs> Um, and, you know, that's one of the things that uh, we're dealing with, even in the medical marijuana side, is bugs and mold and mildew 
uh, are a problem for the industry, and we've got to solve that problem. Uh, in Florida, if you've lived in Florida for more than seven days, you know that mold, mildew, and <laughs> bugs are a problem. Uh, so, you know, we'll, we'll see. Um, and it still comes down to there's a reason that they grow corn in the Midwest and uh, that cotton was great, raised in the South. You know, we'll forget the systematic racism issues, but the, uh, that cotton was grown in the South was because the soil was made for that. Um, and that's the same thing that we're going to find with hemp. Hemp can be theoretically grown in all 50 states, but it really can't be grown in all 50 states. But uh, we have a citrus industry right now that's hurting, and I think we can save them if we can build a product that can uh, be sold. Right. Um, so, Jeff, right. you touched on something that um, I've mentioned before, is, and I don't know if you can answer the question, but why do you think hemp is the only commodity right now being produced by farmers in America that is not subsidized? Do you think it's intentional? Because I heard you say we're a capital-starved industry. There's also no government subsidies, and I feel like a lot of this was intentional to set the, business, the, the industry up for failure. And I'm not trying to lead you on a question, but I feel like it's worth talking about. That's fair enough. Um, and as you know, I have an opinion on everything. Um, <laughs> That's why I have to. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, to that point, uh, Charles's publication agreed to publish some of my articles, and so if you really want to know what I feel, um, just go back and read some of his old article, <laughs> old issues, and you'll kind of see. I, I'm somebody that will always give you my opinion, whether you like it or not. And uh, some people like that, some people don't. Uh, to answer your question, uh, I, I think that the federal government legalized hemp and didn't know what the hell they were doing. Mm -hmm. um, the USDA has been hemp friendly, but not hemp supportive. Mm -hmm. um, the SBA has been hemp unfriendly. Uh, so uh, this government works like a cruise ship, not a speedboat. And <laughs> it takes years and sometimes decades uh, for it to happen. Do I think it's intentional? No. Do I think it's deliberate? Yes. Okay. Um, I, you know, I think that this country was built off of a government that wasn't supposed to work well. Um, when the founding fathers created it, uh, they really wanted... Americans to be able to be Americans and not English. Any One last quick question. How much of your business goes through Amazon? Uh, right now, um, my B2, B2C business, it's 60%. Uh, Shopify is my other 40% of B2C. Uh, B2B business uh, right now is making up a tiny fraction of the company, but you know, in July it starts making up uh, Ninety percent of my business. So, um, the um, I proved concept with Amazon. I, I learned that for every four cans bought, a five pack is bought. We went from a novelty product to a habitual product, um, proving that on Amazon. And so, for us, what Amazon did more so than the numbers was prove concept. Um, and even you know we're not, we're selling. Um, Three to four thousand dollars a month on Amazon, not a huge number, but the data that I got from Amazon got me a ten million dollar contract. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, great. Jeff, thank you much. Yes, sir. So we're done, right? We're done. We're done. Uh, so we're going to go from hemp into uh, licensing of hemp, uh, growing in Florida, learning to grow your business. And if you've seen Josh's booth, he had a booth here selling some products. Uh, and he's a, he's a giver. He's not a taker, he's a giver. He gives back. Uh, and not too many people in this business give back. And maybe that's something you can, we can learn from this, from Josh, besides his business acronym of what he does and how he does it but to give back. So as you begin to start your journey into business, remember it's not all take. It's what you give back. And whether you give dollars, time, or even sometimes advice, it's not a one-way street. It's always a two-way street in business. And if you try to run that one-way street, guess what? 
you run one way and they run the wrong way. So you got to run two ways with that. So remember that. So now I'm going to bring up Josh and talk about his business and the very everything he does. Appreciate it. Hello, everyone. How are you doing today? Come on, you guys are better than that. It's like 11.30. You guys should be like awake by now. Come on. How's everybody doing today? There we go. Come on. You have some oxygen in those lungs. Um, what, I'll just take a second. Shelby, is the camera uh, video running on the live? Okay, fantastic. So everybody, uh, welcome to the Hemp Convention here. Um, J Dean and Jana do a fantastic job putting this on every year. And unfortunately, um, this year with COVID and everything, uh, demand has been down for the industry, and we are, as an industry as a whole, looking to turn that around, because as uh, G G uh, Jeff talked about, and uh, Charles has mentioned, I'm sure other speakers, uh, hemp is very important to Florida's agriculture and its uh, financial stability here, because a lot of the other crops in Florida are not being as successful as they used to be. We got a lot of old defunct citrus orchards, we got a lot of tomato farmers who pivoted, Mexico pretty much decimated our blueberry industry. So there's a lot of farmers in Florida who are looking for another option, and many of them don't know how easy it is to get into growing hemp. So um, a little bit about me first. Um, so um, I'm an Army veteran, uh, I'm a Florida native, and I spent three years in the U.S. Army. Uh, as a result of my service, I spent 20 years addicted to VA pharmaceuticals. Everything you can possibly think of from every family of medication the VA would give me. Um, after 20 years of struggling with um, addiction to pharmaceuticals from the VA, I tried to quit and wound up hospitalized. After my hospitalization for three days of stabilization through IV drugs, I left and at a gas station was filling up my car I don't recommend this, by the way. But I found CBD gummies. Behind the counter, they were expensive. <laughs> they were $20 a bag. I'm not going to lie. And I just didn't want to take the Xanax. I wanted to take anything but a, a pill. I was so tired of being on prescriptions and being a hostage to the pharmaceuticals that um, I paid $20 for a bag of gummies, and I filled up my car with gas. And I drove home, and I uh, didn't make it home. I, I got about halfway home, and they kicked in. And for nobody who's ever tried a really quality CBD product, I had the most overwhelming sense of peace and tranquility and calmness come over me. And I literally looked at the bottle, and I looked at my, my wife at the time, and I said, you know, I think if I took these every day, I wouldn't need to take any more of the Xanax. So I turned the car around, I went back to the gas station. Real talk, I thought I was like, they're gonna take these off the shelf. I don't know what's in this, they just jerk spice. I better buy all the gummies I can get my hands on. So I bought $100 worth, and I spent all my money on the gummies, and I went home, and over the next six weeks, I did some research, I figured out what CBD was, and um, in that six weeks, I broke a 20-year addiction to pharmaceuticals, to, to benzos, and I was off completely after just six weeks, and they only gave me seven Xanax. So as a result of that, I got on medical cannabis uh, two months later. I broke a 20-year addiction to opiates in 90 days, and then I became an advocate in the industry. My first conference was FMCCE by Gene and Dana, uh, June of 2018. I joined an organization called Veterans for Cannabis, a fabulous organization by Joshua Luttrell in Georgia, and started to really learn about this industry. And I started wanting to tell other veterans that there was a way to get off pharmaceuticals, that there was an option, that there was something that actually worked better that they may not have heard of and they weren't going to get it from their doctor at the VA. And so that caused me to transition into creating a nonprofit. And that nonprofit is called Karma Core. And our focus is to teach other veterans to, about CBD and how they can use it as a way to get off pharmaceuticals through the cultivation of hemp and then as a way to use that cultivation skill to become self-sufficient starting their own business. There's a lot to unpack there. But our mission is really focused on just enriching the community and improving people's lives. By empowering other people, you empower the community as a whole, and rising tide lifts all ships. So I'm one of those people who believes in helping the person next to me before myself, because if I do that, in theory, there should be someone next to me helping me. And in that way, we stop thinking about ourselves. So what I did was I started to work at sharing the information about cultivation, creating projects where people could come and volunteer, getting hands-on exposure with the plant, experience in the life cycle, learning how to grow it. It's extremely therapeutic if you've never worked with these plants, and I mean like not like two in your closet, but like 500 in a, in a warehouse or like 1,000 in a, in a greenhouse. These plants are extremely therapeutic. There is something about the plant that allows you to bond with it 
And when I figured that out, I wanted to create a place where everybody could come and learn to bond with the medicine that they were gonna make to heal their body. And I believe that when you do that, the medicine works more effectively. It's a personal hypothesis. I don't have any scientific evidence, but I think if you start growing the plant, you will find out you pretty much learn the same thing. So we're about several things. We're about sustainability, financial independence. We want you to have personal freedom. Um, the entrepreneurship, uh, we mentor people through starting their own business, whether you want to do LLC, incorporation, whether you want to do a nonprofit. Um, we, we really want to help empower other people to become self-sufficient. The therapy, like we said, there's a certain therapy that comes through the cultivation of the medicine and the food that you're going to use to return your body to homeostasis. And learning that process will allow you to cultivate more than just hemp. If you've got a tent at home, you can put hemp plants in there. You can put ashwagandha. You can put um, all kinds of things that are super beneficial to you that don't just tunnel vision on one plant, but understanding that it's going to take several things to return your body to balance. And if you can learn to cultivate one, you can learn to cultivate another. And suddenly, you have a food garden, and you're self-sufficient, and you can manage your own health care. And this is systemic. And that's where the medication guidance comes in, teaching you how to use the resources and the skills you learned so that you can go and manage your own life without being codependent on someone else, i.e. your doctor or the pharmaceutical companies or Publix, for example. So two things we focus on here in Florida, growing legally and starting a business. So how many people in here would want to grow cannabis if they could? A show of hands. That's it? Seriously? Okay. Fair enough. All right, that's better. That's better. That's what I thought. All right, don't be shy. Seriously. So, how many? How, if just as a as a as a blow it out there, how much do you think it costs? And if you know the answer, don't say it. For the people who don't know, how much money do you think it costs to get started to grow legally in the state of Florida to be permitted for hemp? Another answer. So the actual hemp permit in Florida that you apply for to cultivate legally is zero dollars. The process to qualify for that permit can cost as little as $50. I haven't had a single person who's done it on their own who has spent more than $85. Yeah, a couple of you are just like, I see you, just like can't believe it, right? Well, there's a reason for this. So the Farm Bill in 2018 legalized the cultivation of cannabis L sativa, hemp, with a percentage of 0.3 THC or lower for retail sale in Florida. What does that mean? That means that anybody in Florida now has the ability to legally cultivate a hemp plant. Well, to do so, there's a couple things you have to do to, be, to qualify for that process. So you have to have land that is zoned either agricultural or industrial. So how many people here would grow at home if they could? Yeah. So, well, did you know that you can get an agricultural exemption at most addresses in Florida with a nursery license. The cost of a nursery license is $35. There's literally no prerequisites for a nursery license other than you having a potted plant on your property at the time of inspection. One plant, one inspection, $35 agricultural exemption. Thank you, backyard nurseries. Thank you, community gardens. They went to the state and got this done. They really helped us be able to have more power at home to cultivate. But what most people don't understand is it also applies to cultivating anything. So say you want to sign up for the process. What's the first step? So you, if you had a drug-related felony in the last 10 years, and I, what I mean by that is if you had it 12 years ago, but you were on probation three years, and it ended nine years ago, you still have another year to go. But if 15 years ago you had a drug-related felony, you did th two years of probation, it's been 13 years, you should qualify. Anything else on your record shouldn't preclude you from qualifying for an application to cultivate hemp in Florida. So the first step is to sign up for these fingerprints. You can go to a website I use. It's easy. It's 50 bucks. You can register online. They track all your stuff. You can log back in, print out your records, track what's called your, uh, your TCN, your transfer control number, and transaction control number. And what that does is it's going to report to FDAC once you have these fingerprints done, and it's going to tell them this person has passed a background check and has nothing that would preclude them from qualifying for a license to cultivate hemp. So for $50, you're going to do fingerprints. And anyone who wants this afterwards, I'll send you all this information just for the, so you know. Uh, it's also posted online. I have a group with all of this information. You can go and read it over. You can follow it step by step. 
So after you have the fingerprints done, it takes about a day or so, you apply for the nursery license. If you're in an area that doesn't currently hold an agricultural or industrial zoning, a nursery license is much easier than getting an ordinance change or petitioning your county or trying to get your home rezoned. Believe me, this is the easy way. And it's created as a way that once you get the license and you have the nursery license and you're, and you're in possession of your plants, now because you're a nursery license, you can actually sell plants. So now we're getting into additional revenue streams. You're not just being dependent on speculative growth, farming flour, hoping you're gonna make something. You can keep a couple plants in the corner at your home in veg under 18 to 20 hours of light a day and guess what? You can start selling clones three to five dollars a piece to all these other speculative farmers who are having 800 of them who have qualified for a permit in Florida. People in the gold rush didn't get rich finding gold, they got rich selling shovels, okay? So when you look at this industry, don't just look at end product. Don't just think you're only gonna make money growing flour. There's a ton of need for good supply chain parts in this industry from seed to shelf. And I know because I'm part of the gaps in them. I'm seeing them on a weekly basis, that there are pitfalls, there are shortfalls in this industry that could be remedied by a couple really smart people with enough ambition to do it. So don't think that just because this industry's been around five years, there's nothing left to, new to do. Believe me, about 60% of this industry isn't even being covered in Florida. It's about 40% active, and the other 60% is people just trying to figure out how to make stuff work. And that's the honest truth. So don't be afraid to get into this industry. It's not expensive, it's not exclusive, and it's open to everyone. There's no one in this room that can't go out and qualify for this hemp permit if they want to. So once you have the, 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 the fingerprints done, once you've applied for your nursery license, you'll call an inspector, he'll come out, he'll look at your plant, They'll say, all right, you got one plant, $35. In about six weeks, you'll have a nursery license registration. You'll take that nursery license registration. You'll take your control number from your fingerprints that comes in the email. And you'll go to, oh, I can't go back, can I? Yeah. And you'll go to hemp.fdax.gov at the Florida State site. And you will put in the information given. You can do it as a person. You can do it as a business entity. I recommend a business for a couple reasons, liability protection, uh, financial accountability, taxes. If you're gonna be doing anything for, for business, you should be writing it off, you should be deducting your expenses. It shouldn't be coming out of your personal bank account. For the small amount of money it takes to set up a business and keep it compliant every year, a couple hundred dollars, it's worth it to have the tax exemptions and to keep your income separate, and we'll talk about that next in the presentation. So, did anyone in here realize it was that simple to get a hemp permit? So now, why aren't you guys growing? Like, for $85 a year, you can get clones, you can put them in your property, and you can start learning to grow the plant. And the biggest pushback I get from people who want to, don't grow hemp is, well, I want to grow cannabis. It is cannabis. And if you can't grow this plant, you won't be able to grow medical when it comes legal. So spend two years messing this up, believe me. You're going to cry a lot less if you lose 10 pounds of this than you are 10 pounds of medical. Because I'm telling you right now, that garage gets expensive. So you want to start playing, you want to start learning, you want to start doing some R&D, which nutrients are better, whether you're going deep water culture, are you using living soil, are you going salts, guess what? This is a cheap way to R&D. If you're going to sell the product, we talked about creating a business out of this. The hemp bill specifically states, if you are cultivating cannabis L sativa hemp, for retail sale in the state of Florida. It must be tested and certified by a third party lab 30 days before you harvest. That means you have to partner with a local lab. There are several good ones. I recommend Americana, it's the one I use. They come out 30 days before harvest. They snip your plant, four samples of it. They go into a bag, they get sent to the lab. The lab does what's called a, a, a potency test to check the level of THC in your, in your product. That level is then reported to FDAC. At the same time you order this sampling, you also email FDAC and you say, hey, 30 days from now, I'm gonna harvest these plants. I'm letting you know that I'm cultivating hemp with an intent to harvest for retail sale. They will contact the lab and say, hey, 
we have a farmer who's going to harvest some hemp. Did you guys get a lab from them? They said they were using you, and the lab's going to say, yeah, here's the percentages. As long as you're under 0.34% THC, 0.34, we round up in math. So it's not 0.35, it's 0.34 and under. You can legally cultivate that product, and you can harvest it. If it's over that level, if you get a 0.5 THC level, there are two options. You can request a resampling based on the fact that you feel like the results are inaccurate. And if it comes back that the product has in fact exceeded the legal amount of THC, you will be required by the state of Florida to dispose of that product in totality. So any byproduct of that product, any flower grown, all of it has to be destroyed. And by that we mean it has to be disposed of in a way that renders it unidentifiable and useless. So you will list this disposal plan with AFDAC. You'll let them know, I recommend on-site incineration. You can tell them you've destroyed the crop and you can go about your business, put in more plants, start cultivating again. Now, there is a, a slight fee involved with testing. It's $225 to get one strain sampled by the lab when they come out. For every additional strain, it's $120 per strain. So if you're growing five strains, it can get pricey. One thing the hemp bill did really good was give us a lot of leeway to be able to do some testing. And if you're not cultivating the plant for retail sale, if you're just doing R&D or you're growing some hemp to, for personal use to try to make a product before you sell it, testing is optional. So don't think you can't grow a couple plants, you know, check the CBD see how the product formulation works, test your drying methods. If you've only got five plants and you're gonna test your drying room and you're not gonna sell that product, you don't have to pay to have it tested. You can simply harvest it, test your drying room, and either destroy it or use it personally. But you can't sell anything that you have tested in the state of Florida that exceeds 0.3%. It must be destroyed. Understand that. This is not a license to cultivate medical cannabis at home and sell it or knowingly break the law. This is a way for you to have access to the plant legally to start your cultivation training and to sell it legally as long as it's compliant. Does anybody have any questions? Jody. Okay. Jody James, Florida Cannabis Action Network. So let's talk about testing requirements if you're only doing clones, because now there's no harvest. I grow 500 clones, I have no obligation to test them? So if you're selling clones or if you're growing clones? So you mean if I buy 500 clones and I put them out and I run them all the way to flower, am I required to test them? Yeah. Yeah. Jody James grows stuff. Uh-huh. Not well. But um, I decide to put out, you know, two flats of seed, uh -huh. and they all come up, and now I have beautiful, uh, what's one of them that I hear? Cherry uh, wine. Sure, sure. And I have two flats of them. I can sell them to you with no testing requirement? So the, the, the rule on selling clones is there must be a chain of custody for the plant, and you must have a COA, a certificate of analysis, the same as you do on the harvest strain, that certifies that the THC of the mother plant that it came from or the seeds that were it came from, you said you were putting out seeds in a plant. When you get the seeds, they'll come with a COA that says, hey, the plants these were taken from had a 0.29 THC at the time that they were har uh, sampled. So that's a compliant strain. Once you harvest that strain and you, and you take the seeds off of it, any of the seeds you sell or any of the clones you sold off of a plant that you grew from that, those seeds, you would use the original COA from the mother plant because we don't have anything to base testing on because that actual clone has never gone into flower. So you must have a chain of custody and you must have a certificate of analysis that follows the plant from its beginning to end to prove that you sourced a product that was compliant. And seeds in Florida are supposed to be are certified. There's Language in the bill that gets confusing about AOSCA certification and certified seeds, but understand that as long as you, you source any seed that's certified, either by uh, a state agricultural department or a university or an AOSCA certified seed seller, 
Those are all legitimate, legally sourced, certified seeds. Did that answer your question? So there's the rule. You cannot only cultivate hemp with a THC less than 0.3% for retail sale. If you're growing for personal use in R&D, like we said, you don't have to worry about testing. If you're not growing a bunch of plants, it, it gets expensive. I, I have 30 plants growing at my property right now near Tallahassee in an area to see if I could get irrigation to work, how much sunlight it was gonna get. I'm probably gonna get less than a pound off of it. Am I gonna pay to have that crop sampled? No. I'm probably just gonna mulch it or, you know, or, or compost it or ferment it or do some R&D testing on a couple different KNF methods, Korean natural farming. But I'm not going to go and stress myself out. Oh, I got 10 plants. I'm going to see if this room works. It's going to cost me. No, I'm gonna, just going to see if the plants work. You know, the, the, What I've really noticed, and this has been really fantastic, and I want to shout out to Brian Benson, for those of you who don't know him, our director of DPI for the Division of Plant Industry is here. This department is fantastic. They are absolutely wonderful to work with. Every single person that I've ever dealt with from their office every inspector that's ever come to my farm, anyone that's ever been interacted with me personally has been helpful, has been understanding, has been more than willing to help me find answers to the questions we both had. They're not out here trying to go, oh, you're not doing it right, we're shutting you down. We're gonna call the cop. That's not how it is. They want our hemp program to be successful. They want you to succeed in the hemp industry. And the only way to do that is to make it easy to work with the department. So if any of you are worried about growing because you don't want to deal with the state of Florida, let me change your mind right now. FDAC is fantastic to work with. From top to bottom, the whole department is wonderful. And I wanted to say that because they get a lot of times there's a bad rap and there's people online, oh, you know the state of Florida. Florida Department of Agriculture and Community Services is a fantastic division to work with. So don't let that stop you from getting into it. The last thing I'll touch on is people always ask me, well, do you sell your flour? Yes. How do I sell my flour? Not at $8 a pound, Jeff, I'm sorry, but $2 a gram. For those of you who know how many grams are in a pound, sorry, Jeff. That's $900 a pound. It's roughly 453 or so grams in a pound. So at $2 a gram, I'm making about 900 pounds. I don't know about you, but that's not bad money. I don't grow a ton of pounds. I'm one of the people, like Jeff mentioned, who grows to pay my bills and eat and give access to education to other people. I'm not at the million dollar scale yet. Maybe Jeff will help me get there. But at $900 a pound, if I can grow 10 pounds over the next three months, I'm gonna make a couple thousand dollars a month. I'm gonna be sufficient. I can manage that. I can manage 10 pounds on my own. I can't manage 10 acres on my own. So when you start thinking about growing and you start thinking about scaling, scaling means you have to multiply everything, not just the cost of input, but the manual labor, the output, the sales contracts. You know, if you've got an acre at hemp sold, that's great. That doesn't mean you can grow five. So learning how to, to grow your business at the right scale for yourself is also critically important. You don't want to grow too fast for yourself, and you don't want to choke yourself off with the poverty mindset that you can't grow fast enough. So that's all I'm really much going to cover on the slide here. Uh, like I said, the process can be done by anyone. There's no one here. I figured it out. Any one of you can get online and figure it out. But if you're one of those people who's like, I don't want to do it, pay me 250 bucks, and I'll get you licensed and permitted at your address. <laughs> if you want to go through the process of becoming a retail seller, you don't understand testing. You don't understand harvest reporting. You don't understand compliance. You don't understand labeling. You can hire me for $2,500 a year, and I will oversee all of your compliance issues, give you all the answers up front, tell you where to find everything. Probably, you can ask Ashley, I'll probably give you most of the information. And even if you don't pay me, I'll probably give you most of the information. You can ask most <laughs> of these people, but I like to eat too. So we do offer this. But if anyone in this room knows someone who wants to get a permit and they don't have money and they just want to know how to do it, you can go to facebook.me, the Grow at Home Florida Legally page. This is my own group. It has everything I had in this presentation listed in one easy post back on January 25th that you can walk yourself through. Click, click, click. Go to the websites. Do the stuff. You can figure it out. If you need my help, message me. If you can't pay me, I'll still help you. That's it.
So now I believe I'm supposed to be um, also presenting another presentation on growing your business. Um, Jeff did a really fantastic job about talking about the components of, of growing a business. And I don't have the experience Jeff has, but what I will back up and talk about at just a little, a, a little rudimentary level is, most people also don't understand how easy it is to start a business. Most people are very intimidated by the thought of owning their own business, just like they're intimidated by the thought of applying for a hemp permit. Well, I don't want FDAC here. I don't want my house expected. What do I got to do to qualify? It's... Tranquillo. CBD. Take some gummies. These processes are super easy. You know how I know? Because they're made for farmers. And I don't know if you've met a lot of farmers. They're smart. But these are not complicated people. They're very simple people who do really good work, who are smart. And if they can figure it out, all of us can do it. So for growing your business, I already covered Karma Core. I'm not going to bore you guys again with that. We know what we do. As far as starting a business, why should you start a business? Has anyone in here ever thought about starting their own business and hasn't? Okay. I suggest everyone start their own business. Why? Everyone in this room is good at something. Everyone in this room has a skill set. Every single one of you has information in your head someone would pay for. But guess what? They don't know you have it because you're not putting it out there. How much does it cost to start a business? Well, you can do three, three things for starting a business. You can either go corporate, you can go LLC, which is a limited liability company. It's the most basic. You can do it as a sole proprietor, one person. You can do it as a partnership with two or more people. And it offers you basic liability against being sued. What does that mean? Well, if you start a business and you create a product and that product harms someone, Someone can hold you responsible for the harm. It's liability. They can come back and sue you. If you're making CBD products at home and you make, an, uh, make a cream and you sell that cream to someone and it ends up giving them a second degree burn because they had a reaction to an uh, 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 ingredient you used, they could come back and sue you. Take your house, take your car, take your everything. So say I have a business. I have a limited liability company. Now my company is making the product. My company is selling the product. Same product hurt the same person. Well, now that person can't take my house. They can't take my car. They can take my business. They can take the equity in my business. They can sue my business. But what you do is insulate yourself privately from the liability. The exception to that is if you have a sole proprietorship, and a lot of people do this, and I'm going to recommend you don't do it. A lot of people go into sole proprietorship thinking, well, I want to have total control, and I don't really want to have to ask anybody else what to do, and it's just me, and I don't have a husband or a wife or a... Well, if you're a sole proprietor in an LLC, and somebody goes to sue your company, when you end up going to court, what's most often going to happen is they're going to look at you and go, so how many people in your company? And you're going to go, me. And they're going to go, well, then you're liable, because it's just you. But if there's two people in a, in, in, a, in, a, in a partnership of an LLC or more, divides liability. So now you say, how many people in your company? And I say, well, it's me and Jeff. And they go, well, who's, who's at fault? And I look at Jeff, and Jeff looks at me. And I'm like, well, it's not my fault. And then they're like, well, then I guess we can't hold either one of you responsible. Protect yourself. And don't do a sole proprietor. You might as well just be, you might as well save the money and just do it on your own because you're just opening yourself up to as much liability. And now they're gonna hit you on the personal side and the business side. You're gonna lose everything on both folds. But how much does it cost to set up an LLC? It's like 130 something dollars, 137 I think or something. It's super, super inexpensive. And all the forms are online. And all the forms are online. You can go to sunbiz, I should have put this in there. You can go to sunbiz.org, S-U-N-B-I-Z dot O-R-G. You can read all of their Q and A's on what kind of business is right for me, what goes into starting an LLC, what goes into starting a corporation. So that was the next level. So say you're not going to do an LLC. Say you're like Jeff and you think one day I'm going to have a big corporation. I'm going to be Microsoft, right? I'm going to have a board and I'm going to have all these positions and all this. I'm going to have a, a, a charitable arm. And so it sounds like you have big plans. You're not just trying to create a little limited liability company so you can sell product and not get sued. You have dreams. That would fall under more of like a corporation, Corporation usually has a, required to have a board, three or more people, none of which are related, or none of, none of which the related parties equal 50 or more percent. What does that mean? If I have three people on my board and it's me, my lawyer, and my mom, that doesn't count because my mom and I could take over the company by having a two-thirds vote. 
So you have to divide the board up among people who are not related. So corporations fall into two categories, a C Corp and an S Corp. I'm not gonna get super into detail on them because the details are complicated, not complicated but not major. <laughs> but, there are, but, 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 but there's a lot of good information on some biz that'll help you figure out which one you do. Typically people do an S Corp because there's tax advantages to it and it's easier to file. But on some more complicated things, you might have to file a C Corp. For example, I run a nonprofit. What does that mean? I run a nonprofit corporation formed exactly the way a for-profit corporation does, but I filed as a C Corp because I was gonna apply to the federal government to have my business considered exempt from taxes. Why? Because the purpose of the company that I run is designed for community enrichment. I don't take money, I put money back into the community. Therefore, the money I take in should not be taxed, and I should not have to pay revenue on it. So I filed a C-Corp, and then I filed for what's called a 501c3 tax exemption federally. There are about 15 different types of tax-exempt organizations. They fall into things like membership, veterans organizations, um, trade, trade associations, trade associations uh, political organizations, uh, churches. There are several different types. I highly encourage everyone to go nonprofit. Why? You can still take salaries. You can still make all the money that you can make in a for-profit to a, to a degree if you're, if you're not set on selling the company, scaling it, and getting a $10, $10 million acquisition. <laughs> if, this, Jeff, if this is something you're gonna do forever and you're gonna die poor, like me. So I suggest people do it as a nonprofit. Why? Well, our government's not really responsible with the money we give it. So I believe in using my money more responsibly for the things I feel are important to me. Having a nonprofit allows me to take in money and the profits of which, as long as they align with my mission, I can do with as I choose. I still can take a salary, I still can take bonuses, I still can pay employees, I can still do all of those things without the federal government keep dipping its hand in my pocket. So that's why I suggest nonprofits. They're slightly more expensive, I think in totality it cost me about $1,100 to set one up. Um, my tax return is three check boxes. If I don't take more than $50,000 in, which makes filing really easy. My renewals every year are like $63 for my annual reports, which you'll have to do with any business once a year towards the end of May. You have to file a renewal with the state of Florida that certifies that your business is still active. And you, if you're a corporation, you have to submit board meeting minutes for your annual meeting and then update any people who have either left or joined your company. It's a standard, it's a standard procedure. It's once a year, super non-invasive. You can even pay someone, like a paralegal, we actually have one, like a couple of hundred dollars a year, and they will track all your mail for you, they'll tell you what's important, they'll remind you when you're supposed to renew, they'll Zoom your annual meetings, they'll record your minutes. None of this stuff should scare you. It's just a matter of learning it and putting it into practice. Starting a business is not complicated, it's not expensive. It just takes learning some basic things so that you can be in compliance. That's the thing we don't want. We don't want you going out and just doing something because you have a great idea and opening yourself up to a bunch of liability. We don't want you starting a business and then forgetting to report annually. And then two years later, you realize you've been, file, you've been running an inactive company. It happens all the time. It's, it, it's super common. But it can be avoided with a couple simple steps. Have a lawyer as your general counsel. We have one if you need one. He will answer mail and questions on demand. Paralegals, put them on your board. Pick one out. They're not expensive. You can find independent ones who will track your minutes, will tell you when your annual filings are. They can create documents for you. They can actually apply for these LLCs and corporations. I think if you hire ours, it's 350 bucks, and she'll set up your corporation or your LLC for you. Super affordable so that you can go out and know you're compliant. Most of the reasons why people don't start businesses is because they're scared. They don't want to get in trouble. They don't want to make a mistake. They don't want to wind up getting themselves in more trouble by owning a business they know nothing about. Well, guess what? Do what you're good at. If you're good at making snuff, make snuff. If you're good at growing plants, grow plants. Let the accountant, let the paralegal, let the lawyer on your board, let them handle that stuff. There are actually lawyers out there, like my lawyer will sit on a board for nothing. He will just sit as a general counsel for nothing every year. I think it's $25 a year. Let me back that up. 25 bucks a year, you can put his name on your company and they will literally go through your mail when it comes in and tell you what's, what's necessary to answer and what's not. There's, 
Not everybody out there is trying to take money from people. Not everybody out there is trying to overcharge you. You can really shop around and find people who can help you with this stuff, and you can really do a lot to empower yourselves. And if there's any or anything I can do, if you guys you want to find me, you want to get a business card afterwards, there's nobody I won't help. There's nobody I won't take time to help anywhere. Not just veterans, not just people who pay me, but anyone who wants it, and I have information, I will give it to you for free. That's just how I work. Once you get your, your corporation set up, one of the things you'll do is um, you'll have to file for an EIN. So an EIN is an employee identification number or a TIN, tax identification number. This is like a social security number for your business. Why is this important? If you start a business, you do not want to pay for things out of your personal bank account. That is, that is not good. You don't want to co what they call commingle finances. You want to keep business finances separate from personal finances. If you need to use personal money to start your business, you should document it as a loan to the company that is accounted for. So that way, when you start making revenue, you can take loan repayments. But you can track them as separate, personal loan to a new business and a business payment to a personal loan. But you're not just saying, yeah, I just used my personal money to pay for that. It, that you, in the end of the year taxes, that's never going to fly. It's going to be the first thing that gets you shut down, commingling finances. How do you prevent that? Tax ID number, EIN, the same number. It's just like your social. It's nine digits long. You put it down on everything instead of your social, and now at the end of the year, you file your taxes and your business's taxes. Well, what does that mean? Well, we talked about setting up a grow in our house. That's not free. I got to buy pots. I got to buy lights. I got to buy soil. Probably need a dehumidifier. If you're anywhere in Florida, you're probably going to need an air conditioner. Like, all of this is an expense, but as a business, it's a write-off. It's a tax deduction. What does that mean? Well, if I spent $8,000 getting started on growing my, my profit, and I wound up growing, we'll say we spent $9,000. We set up our grow. We grew it. We got 10 pounds out of it. We sold it all for $2 a gram. We got $9,000. Guess what? How much do we owe at the end of the year? Nothing. We spent nine. We made nine. That's a tax deduction. All of your expenses get to count against the money you make, so you're only actually going to pay taxes on the money you have left over minus all the money you spent to get there. And that would be your net income, what you're actually going to pay taxes on. You have gross income, expenses, and then net income. If you don't have a business, if you don't have an EIN, you can't have expenses. You're just going to eat everything. So, and EIN numbers are free. And EIN numbers are free. They are, you call the number, you, you can do it on the phone, you put your information in, they tell it in, they just give it to you. The one thing you have to remember is that tin is only good for one business. You can't start another business and then be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to start a new company. I'm just going to use my older tax ID number. It doesn't work like that. It's just like a social. You can't use your mom's. And you need a new tin, a new EIN for every business. Every entity has a different one. Um, so what goes into starting the business? Well, the, it's pretty much the same process through the, 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 the corporations and the, and the LLCs with minor verbal changes. But... For basic understanding, you're going to file articles of incorporation. These are the documents you file with the state of Florida that give your purpose of business. They list the board members or any owners who have a stake in the company, uh, an ownership in the company. And this is where you'll give all that information to the state of Florida, and you'll submit it, and they'll either approve or deny you based on the information you submitted. It's not super complicated. If you look at the form right now, it is confusing, but not complicated just have to read a little bit. Um, once you have the uh, articles of incorporation done, um, you can do, well, I'll go back, you, you, you set up a set of bylaws. What are bylaws? So bylaws are the, are, are the, are the rules by which you're going to run your company, how your board members are going to be elected, how you're going to deal with profits, how you're going to issue bonuses or salaries, whether or not you're going to have stock certificates, what those are going to be worth, if there's going to be divisions, what does that mean? Like, if you invest in a company and I give you a stock certificate and it's worth $10, but we decide we need twice as many certificates, we could make them all worth $5, but now you get two. That's a stock division. All these things are laid out in bylaws. The cool thing about companies is you literally get to write these. You literally get to do anything you want in there. I'm talking Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Alice in Wonderland. You can get super creative. You can make a business as custom tailored to what you're gonna do and how you wanna run it as you want, as long as it's compliant. As long as you're paying taxes, doing the recording, and doing the reporting, 
you can pretty much run it as any way you want to. And you get to design that by creating bylaws that say, this is how I want to run my company, and this is how we're going to do things. And typically, it's done by the board. It's typically voted on. Any amendments to the bylaws are typically also voted on. Um, we, we, we talked about stock certificates. What is that? Well, when you start a company, typically, like Jeff talked about, you're going to need to raise money. You're going to want to take investment. So what your company does when it starts out is it starts out with a certain number of these top stock certificates, and you get to actually choose it. I can choose one stock certificate. I can choose a million. It literally doesn't matter. What matters is the valuation or the value you put on your total business that gets divided by the number of certificates you have. So when you're going to start a business, if you're planning, like Jeff said, to go take $2 million, and you know that you're going to need probably 20 investors with $100,000 each, you're going to want at least 20 stock certificates because not one person's going to give you $2 million. You probably want like 2000 but I'm just using a rough number to give you guys the idea. You want to issue stock certificates so that way you can go out to someone and say, hey, I have a company that I think is worth $2 million. I'd like to sell you a stock certificates. I'd like to sell you 25% of my stock certificates if you give me $500,000. Basically, you're giving me a quarter of the valuation of my company, and I'm giving you a quarter of the ownership of the company in stocks. That's how stock certificates work. They, they go with any company. Most, I would say most businesses neglect to issue stock certificates and they get to, neglect to use them either because they're not focused on selling the company or taking investment, or they don't understand the leverage in them. Because you can do a lot with employees in the beginning by offering stock certificates in a company that they feel like is valuable, and they will work a lot harder for their own success than yours. Just a tip. So these are the four types of businesses. You got sole proprietorship, you got a partnership, you got the corporations, and then you got the LLCs. Always, always, always stay away from sole proprietorship if you can help it. It's just a liability nightmare. Um, we talked about writing the bylaws. So you will have to submit these when you go to open bank accounts, if you apply for funding, um, if you try to purchase, well, not purchase property, but if you try to pretty much just banking and loans. Um, there's a couple, couple times I've been asked for bylaws, I think, with, um, I had to submit them for my 5013 exemption at the federal level. Um, they won't typically be really visible, but um, I don't know. Are all, are all bylaws public record? I think they're filed with your SunBiz. Fi Any ones you file with SunBiz are public record. Initially they are. Aren't they? Articles of Corporation. Uh, Articles of Corporation. So the bylaws may or may not be public. Mine are because I'm a nonprofit. And what that means is anyone, anytime can come to ask to see my articles of incorporation, my bylaws, and my books. I have I to be completely transparent with everyone about where the money comes in and where it goes. That's, I believe, an upside to the nonprofit because it helps with accountability. It keeps people honest. I don't worry about people looking at my books because I don't take in a lot of money and all of it goes back to where it's supposed to. But if you have a privately traded company, then that information would be private to you unless it was solicited by a, like a court or a subpoena or something. Um, so the EIN, like we said, talk about the bank account for uh, the social security number for your business, so it allows you to file taxes separately, and then the stock certificates. They're a great idea. They're underutilized. They can be great motivation for um, a new company. Typically, when companies get started, a lot of the people who decide to come on early are very excited, and they typically don't stay excited very long. Why do I think that is? Because people don't want to work for other people's dreams. So if you give them a dream too, they'll work harder. Um, if we can help you grow your business, you can check us out at Karma Core. We do focus on volunteers. We will help our veterans, but we will help anybody who comes out to be a volunteer or get involved with the organization or just says, hey, I don't know what I'm doing and you guys do, so can you help me? Absolutely. The answer is always going to be yes. You can reach out to us. Follow us at Karma Core International. We're on um, Instagram. The Facebook.me is karmacore.org, not international, but that's probably my fault. I probably gave her the wrong information. Um, I think that's it. So. Anybody have any questions? All right. Anyone has a question out there later about getting the permit or starting a business, you just find me. I'll be over at the Karma Court table. I'll give you a card. Like I said, I'm always here to help. Have a great day, guys. All right. Thank you, panel. Appreciate it. Jeff, Josh.
Charles, thank you, gentlemen. And thank you all for coming. Um, we, <laughs> Yeah, as you can see, for those of that have been through Thanks, the last Mr. two conferences, we are definitely down in attendance. So it's not as easy as it thinks or as it looks. And so um, I'm committed to, to keep pushing on to try to bring us together. Um, I'm going to ask everybody, I will tell you, now this is a loss for me, right? So this is my sponsorship to the industry. <laughs> um, I need commitment from you all. Grab somebody and bring them next year. Um, we need the farmers here. I need more farmers. So if you're in the farming community, grab your, your colleagues and bring them. Um, we need to set the cooperatives together to where we're working together. I, my wife calls it co uh, cooperative competition. Um, we, to make this industry grow, we are going to have to work at it together. So with that, I will promise you I will have the proceedings out by the end of this coming week. It's on. Uh, I'm going to go drink a beer and take a nap for the rest of the day. So, Hello. Thank you. Hey, can I just real quick, can we get a hand for Gene and Dana? This is their fourth year doing the conference, fifth year. These people work tirelessly. This conference does not take a month to put together. They work for 12 months on this conference. And then next two weeks from now, they have another conference in the same place here that they're going to work another 12 months on to put on next year. Him and Dana do not get enough credit and recognition for what they do. They're really in important to this industry. If you think about the size of the organizations and the, in the, in the, in the conferences in this business, there's not two bigger than the ones that you're putting on this week and the two weeks by these guys. So support them and show them some love because they do a fantastic job of making this information available. Good morning, I bring you greetings from the College of Love and Charity, Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University. Yeah. On behalf of our president, Dr. Larry Robinson, our provost, Maurice Edison, our dean, Dr. Robert Taylor from the Dean of the College of Agriculture and Food Sciences, we are truly grateful to be here. We will have not been here. I sent the email to Gene and he responded instant yep. because of course the registration was expensive, of course for college students to come. He responded immediately, gave us a discount, and we're truly grateful. We're grateful for every speaker that came to be able to provide us with information. We're grateful for the exhibitors, the networking. We are truly appreciated, and we will definitely make sure we come back next year and have more students with us. All right, y'all go home. 